Welcome to our San Francisco Structures Forum. I, I don't remember what nth annual it is, but uh, we're always so delighted. I feel like it's, uh, I kind of see everyone in the business here. It's great to see all of you and, and feel the, what a great energy we have in this room. We need to sort of transmit this out there into the world today. Um, I'm Mary Huss, publisher of San Francisco Business Times, and along with our partner and title sponsor, uh, Shepard Mullen Richter in Hampton, we are, and our other sponsors, who I will mention in just a moment, we are so delighted to be your host this morning for a discussion, our annual look at um, the future of our magnificent city of San Francisco. Today, uh, we're going to hear from our mayor and from San Francisco's planning director and from a group of developers, leaders, stakeholders who will discuss the bold visions and projects and policies that are shaping San Francisco's future. And while the headlines of the past few days are unsettling this morning included, uh, the financial markets news grim, um, you know, our country is stumbling and stuttering and sputtering, I guess, through a weak recovery, but it seems like San Francisco has been a continued bright spot in our little, I hesitate to use the word bubble, that's misconstrued, but um, in fact, Andy Ball just told me it's a banana belt that we're in. So um, we really are fortunate to be here. There's a lot of good news to celebrate, not to say that it's not uh, still times to be a little bit uh, concerned, but at the same time quite optimistic. So, um, so many significant wins have happened even since that time less than a year ago when the Giants took home the World Series trophy. And we're going to talk today about some of those wins, what they mean to the future of the city, as, as well as many, we're really here to peer into the future, hoped for wins yet to come as we envision the city, as it will be three, five, ten, and further out that many years into the future. We do strive every year to paint the picture in this form of San Francisco's future vision with some attention always to the built environment and a look at and the key projects and a look at the economic and political forces, the policies um, and economic drivers that influence our direction. We always ask our speakers to give us, to really paint a clear picture and tell us what it all means, the things that they're involved in. But we are so fortunate to be situated here in this city of innovation with its rich resource of a magnificent waterfront, its proximity and ties to Asia, our great educational and research institutions, and just a, a wonderful entrepreneurial inventive culture here, a true city of dreams and ideas. With all of its complexity, um, in some of its politics, certainly. Um, so, so many things that you're going to hear about, I don't want to really reiterate, they're in the headlines so much, but, you know, the, the announcement from uh, Salesforce about its Mission Bay campus last year certainly was a, had a, a trigger effect, a big impact, you know, followed on by the Ameris, America's Cup announcement. We're going to hear a little bit about both of those and their wider ranging impact. There's the Twitter effect and sort of a renewed, hopefully, look at revitalizing mid-market. The wrecking balls hit around the Transbay Terminal, and there's work in progress. Significant progress has been made there, and that's a whole new neighborhood within the city that will build up. Um, announcements of the MoMA expansion, SF General underway. Um, the UCSF cardiovascular um, research center at Mission Bay completed this year in a hospital underway there. Pier 70 master developer announced great strides with Treasures, uh, Treasure Island, Hunters Point, Park Merced, and work continues on Doyle Drive. And there's just so much to talk about. We can't possibly capture it all and so much to look forward to. And the projects all have a synergistic effect on our economy and jobs and all of the industries here. We've had such a profusion of technology companies which have driven a robust office market and biotech and clean tech incubators as well as larger companies growing up. So, you know, hopefully we've got discussions underway for the largest private construction project in the city, which is CPMC, and those are progressing. 
Some of the players are in the room today. Um, and many, many things, including exploratory. Like, we can't even talk about it all, but it's so exciting to imagine our future. And just it's going to be so different even in three years and five. So um, let's talk about the progress and let's talk about some of the problems as well and how we can collectively address those and the impact of the economy and how we will drive some job creation here in this great city. But unquestionably, there is a transformation underway and we're paving the way for our next era. So um, I do want to thank our sponsors again, Shepard Mullen, a longtime partner with us on this event. We are so appreciative. They are a full service AM law firm with 560 attorneys and 14 offices in the US, Europe, and Asia, and of course, here in San Francisco. The firm's clients include more than half of the Fortune 500, and with one of the most diverse real estate and land use practices, Shepard Mullen represents investors, developers, builders, major landowners, lenders, and local agencies on every aspect of commercial and residential real estate. And Shepard Mullen is involved in some of the regions and San Francisco's most high-profile projects, many of which I just mentioned, Hunters Point, Trans Bay, UCSF, and even at work on the America's Cup. So we thank David Madway. We're going to bring him up in a minute. He's special counsel, so many of you know and work with him, um, and in the real estate, land use, and natural resource um, part of that full-service firm. So um, in addition to Shepard Mullen, please join me in thanking our other longtime partners and sponsors, and they are Hathaway Dinwiddie. And here's Hathaway, there's Greg Costco sitting right there. And um, you know, recently celebrated, I guess are you now over 100? Okay, so it was the, the big 100th anniversary celebration. They've just been a, a big, big part of building San Francisco, this region, and of course down in Los Angeles and all the, the really great areas um, throughout our state. And uh, Hathaway Dinwiddie is one of those active, creative, and innovative builders in Northern and Southern California, providing general contracting and complete project planning and ma management services in California's most dynamic markets, helping top companies and institutions develop landmark structures and quality interior spaces throughout the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, and Southern California. You'll recognize many of the gorgeous landmarks like Getty Center in Los Angeles, Transamerica Pyramid, Davies Symphony Hall, Fibrogen Building in Mission Bay, and on and on. So we congratulate Hathaway Dentwitty. Thanks to President and CEO Greg Cusco and Dave Lee, COO of Hathaway Dentwitty. And then also very, very involved in so many of the big, big projects and, and um, significant future projects um, in the Bay Area is Smith Group Architects. And we want to thank Jim Hannon, who is healthcare practice leader um, for the firm. And Smith Group is at work on the future structures of San Francisco, including CPMC Medical Center, Cathedral Hill Hospital campus, the UCSF Institute for Regenerative Medicine, um, the UCSF Cardiovascular, these are some just completed cardiovascular research building. Um, and honored as one of the best architecture firms in the U.S. by Architect, the magazine of the American Institute of Architects Smith Group specializes in the planning and design of healthcare, senior living, higher education, research facilities, and workplace projects in San Francisco and beyond. So thanks to the Smith Group. We want to thank our partnering associations, BOMA San Francisco with Mark Intermaggio, its great leader, um, San Francisco Chamber of Commerce, President Steve Falk, its great leader, San Francisco Center for Economic Development, the great executive director, Dennis Conahan, Spur, Gabe Met all these are our great leaders and they all work together. Spur, thanks to Gabe Metcalf, Urban Land Institute as well. Thank you for partnering with us. Our table sponsors, all part of the fabric of getting San Francisco going and growing and built, California Pacific Medical Center, Kilroy Realty Corporation, Shorenstein, Sterling Bank, TMG Partners, and Wilson Meany Sullivan. So thanks to all. And um, you'll see our sponsors, Hathaway Dinwiddie Smith Group, and our title sponsor, Shepard Mullen, on the cover of our June 24th San Francisco Structure Special Edition. There are copies available here if you want to go to our table. It's a full look at the project progress and sort of economic future of San Francisco. A development map all is at the center of it. 
can read the work of um, real estate reporters J.K. Deneen, Blanca Torres, Eric Young, our economic development reporter, and many of our other reporters, and our senior editor, Emily Fancher, always just takes great ownership of this project. We're very proud of it. And I, I'm going to assume you've all read it and seen it because you're all subscribers. Um, if you're not, as I always say, why not? But uh, we do have a special offer today that would save you $15 off the price of a subscription. You just go to the Business Times table right back at there. You can also enter a uh, contest with your card. There's a $200 Amex gift card. If your stock market portfolio has gone down, you may want that. So put your um, card in to get that and also sign up for a subscription. You get full access to all premium content online and um, a book of lists. And uh, don't forget to sign up for our free morning call daily e-newsletter e and our afternoon e-newsletter as well. We're kind of a 24-7 news operation, so check out our San Francisco businessjournals.com website. And my own little economic indicator, if I can give a plug, our print subscriptions have been growing all year long. That to me is a good economic indicator. Circulation up, advertising up, profits up healthy media organization. I only say that to all the people who come up to me and say, how are you doing? Assuming something, but we're doing great. And thanks to all of you because you're a big part of that. On with our program to open the program and set the stage for our presenters, please welcome David Madway, special counsel in the real estate land use and environmental practice at Shepherd Mullen, our longtime title sponsor. As I mentioned, Shepard Mullen is involved in so many of our Bay Area's high-profile projects. David will offer his perspectives on what lies ahead and set the stage for our presentations. Thank you, David Madway. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I appreciate it. Um, welcome, all of you. Um, obviously, I'm not Joan's story. Joan would normally be making this introduction, um, but she has asked me to express to all of you her greetings. Um, I uh, also, of course, want to thank the Business Times and Mary for organizing these festivities and for assembling this terrific cast of speakers. We all appreciate the opportunity to get together and congratulate ourselves for having survived this year. However difficult things may be for certain segments of the development business, particularly for the res residential for sale end of the business, compared to the misfortune which has befallen the rest of the country, the Bay Area is in relatively good shape. Some remarkable changes have taken place over the past couple of years. In the 13 years since the Mission Bay redevelopment project areas were created by the Board of Supervisors, the area north of the China Basin Channel has been completely built out. When, when I worked on that project, those project areas, I frankly did not expect to live long enough to see Mission Bay North built out. But it is just about finished, quite remarkable. Mission Bay South has also seen an enormous amount of development over the last couple of years, including substantial progress in completing the UCSF research campus and the start of construction on a new children's hospital and the eventual development of a women's hospital. For this progress, the agency and its staff, particularly Fred Blackwell, my former colleague Amy Neches, and her associate Kelly Kahn deserve a huge amount of credit. Fin <laughs> Finally, a couple of days ago, the Agency Commission voted to approve the first phase of the design approval process for the 2 million square foot headquarters campus for Salesforce.com. This will be the largest project built in the city since Embarcadero Center, also a redevelopment project. We will hear more about this from one of our speakers. Um, and it's an interesting question why Salesforce elected to make this enormous investment in land, some $279 million, 
and construction for an open campus in the city when most of the tech and biotech giants have chosen to build closed campuses in suburban communities. Mark Benioff, Salesforce's founder and CEO, I thought put it succinctly. He said, the talents in the city. Something to keep in mind. Something um, Twitter, by the way, seems to have agreed, having decided to take on the challenge of rehabilitating the Merchandise Mart. With the gray hulk of the Merchandise Mart on its way to a new life, that should kickstart long-standing efforts to revitalize the mid-market area. Forest City's conversion and rehab of the Chronicle building will make a major contribution to that effort. The waterfront is in for some significant attention as well. The port has picked Forest City to rehabilitate existing historic buildings at Pier 70, which had life as a center of shipbuilding that goes back well into the 19th century. Many thousands of shipwrights and other workers labored there to build warships and cargo vessels as recently as World War II. In addition to the historic rehab aspects of the project, which are in fact daunting, Forest City will have the right to develop upwards of 3 million square feet of newly constructed space on that pier. Salesforce's acquisition of the last large parcels in Mission Bay, suitable for development of the scale currently being planned, um, made a major contribution to intense developer interest in the port's RFP for Pier 70. Pier 70 is about a half mile south of the southernmost reaches of Mission Bay. It is a reminder in this quite small and densely populated city that everything is connected to everything else. Finally, we have what is a contest to complete an environmental impact report that is masquerading as a sailboat race. Uh, This is probably the first time in its long history that the America's Cup has drawn the attention of real estate developers. As most of you know, the Cup organization will become the possessor of several desirable sites along the waterfront. And the development that is expected to go forward on those sites will provide the Cup with, in effect, a permanent endowment. Because cup events are distributed over many months, they are expected to be a major economic driver for the city. Development of the waterfront sites should provide developers with a number of opportunities over the next several years. With that as background, I want to return the gavel to Mary, who will introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, David, for putting such great context on our conversation this morning. By the way, Shepard Mullen has this little tool and flashlight kit as you leave if you want one. I'm going to need one of those. It may be the only thing I have at my disposal should something go wrong. All right, now, we are so delighted to have Mayor Ed Lee with us this morning. It continues our tradition of having the mayor here at each of these programs to put his vision in front of all of us and um, his priorities. Um, I'm always so optimistic after I hear Mayor Lee speak, and I always have the sense that we are getting things done in this city. Um, we've asked him, Mayor Lee to join us to give us his vision and his take on projects and priorities and some of the industry sectors that may drive jobs and, and uh, have the most promise. Um, I'm going to go light on the uh, intros because I want to give our speakers more time. Um, mayor Lee is our 43rd mayor of the city, um, unanimously, I think, as we know, appointed to succeed uh, Mayor Newsom uh, when he became lieutenant governor. And of course, we're so proud to have our first Asian American mayor, but he's so much than that more than that. Um, so I am going to not, if you don't mind, go through his long and uh, productive resume in public service because I really uh, do want to give him his time. Uh, I know he's very focused on issues such as central subway, pension reform, and so many things that 
Um, he counts among his priorities. He is a candidate for mayor, as we all know. We wish him well in that race and continuing to do the good work for this great city. Please welcome San Francisco Mayor Ed Lee. Good morning. How's everybody? All right, all right. Well, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna need your help. And first of all, I wanna thank all of you for being here this morning. It's my pleasure to join the Business Time Structures uh, group and to report to you everything that we're doing. And I'm, as you can tell, I'm, I'm kind of excited about this city. Uh, it is worth everything that we can possibly do to continue its success. And I wanna thank all of you because every one of you uh, are engaging yourselves in this wonderful effort to create jobs, uh, make sure we have a stable economic climate, and make sure we're making the right decisions at City Hall. Uh, I also want to make sure that uh, I thank uh, uh, the team that had been assembled uh, even before I became your interim mayor. Uh, people like Jennifer Matz and John Ram, and now Ed Riskin at the helm of MTA, Monique Moyer at the port, and just wonderful teams of people that I've had the privilege of working with. And I have to also say, I want to thank Gavin Newsom because he had such a vision for this city. And I got to work with him and inherit this wonderful effort that's going on. And then put my own little color and scheme and, and a blessing on so many other things to, make, uh, to get things done. I'm going to talk a little bit this morning about business growth, about central market, our development projects before John Ram comes up and fills you in with a lot of the details and gets you involved in all those uh, wonderful environmental impact plans that we all have. And then, of course, a little bit about our payroll tax. Before I do that, uh, I do want to say that uh, we're going we're gonna to need all of you to be part of a little miracle prayer for our giants this next week. Uh, you know, obviously it's something we're all watching and seeing where it is, but they're going to they're gonna need a little bit of a miracle. And that just says to me that when it comes to our economy and our job creation, we can't depend upon any miracles at all. We have to stay focused. We have to be very professional. We have to engage in our business community. We have to make right decisions every single day. Yesterday, I was at a very successful launch of a little program that we started in Hunters Point called uh, College Track. And it takes the some of the most challenged uh, low-income kids in our Bayview neighborhood and Mission neighborhoods and gets them into a track on college. And these kids, from high school all the way to hopefully when they are admitted to some of the best colleges in the Bay Area of the country, they're sacrificing their personal time to stay away from all of the distractions that we may read about that happens with kids around the Bay Area. And in that exchange that I had with them, I said, if you do your job and you make it through and you focus on your education, we'll be there with those jobs in San Francisco for you. The high tech, the life, the life sciences, the biosciences, the, the jobs that Salesforce is promising, the jobs that Twitter is already doing and Zendesk and others, we'll be there with the best paying jobs if you do your part. And that's the promise I want to carry out with all of you. Because if we're not creating jobs, what are we doing in this city? And that's what I'm going to ask myself every day as I walk down the hallways and look at all the pictures of the other mayors. I get to do that every day. And hi, Gavin. Hi, Willie. Hi, Diane. All of the pictures down in the hallway. And they've been great mayors. And now it's my turn to make sure we are on the right path. And so thank you for joining me today. If we're gonna have a city that it's safe, that is solvent and that's successful, we need to invest in our residents, in our businesses right here in our city. And what I'm gonna do is help our staff run through this because if they can keep up uh, with the slides, you'll see pictures of the things that I'm talking about and hopefully that'll resonate with you as I summarize all the things that we're doing in our business world and in our decision making. And that's why jobs and business climate are my top priorities, and that means creating and retaining jobs and creating the conditions for businesses to start here, to stay here, and to go right here in San Francisco. In our current economic state, 
in August, San Francisco's unemployment rate fell a little bit to 8.8 from its 9.1% in July. This is still the third lowest in California, and we can and we will do better. The good news is that San Francisco is resilient, and we have proven that we are competing and winning businesses even in these tough economic times. San Francisco is home to more than 1,500 technology companies, 74 life science companies, and more than 225 clean tech and green businesses. And that, my friends, translates into real estate. In the first six months of 2011, more than 4.6 million square feet of office space was leased in San Francisco. 4.6. 1.6 million square feet was by tech firms alone. New and expanding tech firms, names that you've already heard and names you may yet have heard, Autodesk, Dropbox, Mozilla, Kabam, Ancestry.com, Splunk, I haven't even been to Splunk yet, <laughs> Yammer, and of course Twitter and Zendesk that you've heard about before. These numbers show that innovation is the key driver of our San Francisco's economy. It also shows that we're a city of innovation and entrepreneurs who dare to think big and to think outside of the box. From clean tech and biotech to social media, gaming and cloud computing, San Francisco's home to the companies and thought leaders that we are putting the, in, the innovation envelope in key knowledge sectors. We draw our inspiration from being a diverse city, a beautiful city to live in, and an international city, a collaborative place where people come to discuss and nurture new ideas. We are important people always working to make things better. And it's in that spirit that I want to talk to you about our efforts on Central Market. You know, I've made revitalizing Central Market a signature economic development initiative. A keystone in this initiative is the Central Market payroll tax exclusion. The payroll tax exclusion incentivizes companies to both invest in mid-market and create jobs. I want to recognize Supervisor Kim and Board President David Chu in their work with me in this important strategy. But this is part of a broader strategy that includes redesigning of the street and sidewalks for the Better Market Street Initiative. That's a, street, that's a streetscape overhaul that will result in a more attractive, walkable, and business-friendly corridor. The project is in its planning phase right now, and it will be implemented from the Ferry Building to Octavia Boulevard in 2015, and the street is repaved, when the street is repaved. Public safety enhancements along Market Street. In 2012, the Mid-Market Police substation will be open on 6th Street. We're also partnering with the Community Benefits District to expand coverage of the safety ambassadors in addition to police in the area. In fact, the safety ambassadors, we plan to hire people from that community be additional eyes and ears, because as you know, when, when, you, when, you, when you talk to these uh, young tech entrepreneurs and their employees, they're not looking at the street half the time. They're on their social media earphones, they're in their iPad 2s, and they're walking and talking and thinking all the time for their 16-hour days. But they also want to make sure that they are safe when they go home at night, 10, 11 o'clock at night. Cultivation of art and culture in the area through recruitment and galleries and theaters, as well as restaurants and nightclubs and retail will draw visitors to the area. You're seeing that happen already, and that's an exciting part of our mid-market. We've seen the positive effects on the successes in Central Market already with companies like Twitter. And as you know, they're staying in San Francisco. They've leased up 200,000 square feet in uh, Central Market at the Furniture Mart building. This is the largest tech deal of the year so far, and they plan to open in 2012. And I want to thank uh, both Twitter and the Shorensteins for partnering up and doing this. Uh, $80 million in retrofitting that building, and then Twitter comes in between 12 and 15 to do their floors. One decision, $95 million immediate infusion into our economy, right there at Ninth and Market. Zendesk, 
Do you know I just opened the offices of Zendesk on the online help desk? I was there that morning. In fact, they actually had a cubicle for me <laughs> with my picture and my wife's picture. And, of course, uh, they promised that that cubicle will be ready if uh, something happens that I don't expect on November 9th. So. <laughs> They're going to grow. They're going to grow from 80 to 150 employees right there on Central Market. And also, I just want to say that uh, you know, these tech companies are not only big job creators. Uh, I have to say, uh, certainly, as you know already, with Mr. Benihoff's contributions to our wonderful city and uh, with the owner of Zendesk uh, in their uh, one night of uh, amassing $5 million to build a children's hospital, we are looking at people joining the great names of Levi's and Coretz and, and Rosenberg's and Charles Schwab and others to be the new generation to add to our philanthropic corporate citizenship. And I really, really am excited about that. New small businesses along market, Central Market Street, Huckleberry Bicycles, San Francisco Camera Work, Piano Fight Productions, Pearl's Deluxe Burgers, which I'll personally be there for, and Off the Grid. They are opening towards this year with the help of our Office of Economic Development. Their Burgoyning Arts District, Black Rock LLC, of course you know that is the parent company for Burning Man. They've moved right their offices, their headquarters right at Central Market, and they provided 20 foot, uh, 20 foot street sculptures in the area. You've seen them, you've walked around them, I have. They're exciting. And we're continuing arts in the storefront for the second year and moving in uh, on UN Plaza, the Arts Market and the Central Market Arts Festival. Looking forward, we have a Central Market economic strategy that will be finalized this fall. The strategy provides a roadmap for deploying city and private resources by prioritizing the policies necessary to bring out the transformation of Central Market. In terms of small business support, Central Market Cultural District Loan Fund that's a city-created $11.5 million pool of low-interest small business loans, which companies have already used to start new businesses. The business in the arts group recruiting and matching and technical assistance, that partnership with Rofo.com allowed the city to launch a website dedicated to posting and locating real estate in Central Market. The service is free for landlords and tenants and can be accessed through the new website www.centralmarketpartnership.org. Let's talk about our financial district. Moving down Market Street, the financial district remains the hub of our city's finance and professional services, but it's also growing to include the clean tech sector. As you know, San Francisco is home to 225 clean tech and green tech businesses. A high concentration of these firms are located right in downtown San Francisco. San Francisco is home to a leading cluster of solar firms, and which include more than 45 companies representing the top solar companies, developers, and installers. Downtown is already home to SunTech, Sunrun, Photowashio Renewable, Enernock, Scientific Conservation, Yingli, GC Solar, and some other companies whose names I can't even pronounce. Yet this past year, that trend has continued. And just recently, in fact, earlier this week, as you may have heard, I announced the launch of Green Start, the first clean tech accelerator in San Francisco. And I love that word, accelerator, because we don't have time to waste, ladies and gentlemen, when not only it comes to job creation, but when it comes to our environment and reducing our CO2 emissions, we simply don't have time to waste. We've got to get those emissions down. And I can't think of a better way to do it than to have a clean tech accelerator attract and stimulate the real new ideas that are coming out. Green Start's first four startups in San Francisco, Lono, Silvatex, Tenrate Technologies, and Watt. Those are the four companies that have started. And every three months, they're going to name four new companies that get the advantage of their uh, not only space, but their introduction to angel investors and the capital investors. And I'll be there in December when these companies make their first financial pitch to their angel investors, in case that's, they've got some great ideas 
and some very, very serious marketing ideas that we're going to want to support. A company called China Synergy. You know, at the InterSolar Conference in July of this year, I announced that China Synergy, which is a major uh, China solar firm, decided to locate their North American headquarters in San Francisco's financial district. This marks the fifth China solar company to locate in San Francisco. That's success for that organization that's been so collaborative, one that Gavin started and I get to continue, called China SF. That's our ambitious business development initiative that's focused on attracting the North American headquarters of Chinese companies entering the U.S. market. Tioga, Tioga Energy, a solar development company, moved their headquarters from Silicon Valley to our financial district. Their main reasons for doing this included the city's strength in financial services, the robust talent, and of course our city's unmatched policy leadership on sustainability issues. And the reasons for this success is clear. San Francisco has led the way with bold environmental policies that aggressively seek to address the environmental problems of our age. People are taking note of this. San Francisco was recently named the greenest city in North America by Siemens Corporation and The Economist. And we, and we lead this nation in carbon reduction, recycling and composting, the adoption of solar, energy efficiency, and electrical vehicle technologies, water conservation, and green building. And if that's not enough happening in our financial district, I also want to let you know, too, that we're going to rebuild that old U.S. Mint right there at Fifth and Mission to make sure that we have our San Francisco Historic Museum alive and well so we can connect what our history is to where we're going as a city. Let me speak a moment about our Transbay Terminal. The Transbay Terminal and surrounding transit district are setting the stage for the next generation of clean, sustainable transportation and extending downtown further south. In our transit center, one million square feet transit center to accommodate bus and high-speed rail. We want to extend the terminus of Caltrain's from 4th and King to downtown. Over 48,000 direct and indirect jobs will be created over the next seven years. Transbay, their redevelopment plan includes, uh, which a plan that was adopted in 2005. That plan will transform an underutilized section of downtown San Francisco, south of Market Street, into a thriving transit-oriented neighborhood. 2,600 new homes, 35% of which are going to be affordable. Three million square feet of new office space and 10,000 square feet of retail. That's what that's going to be. And Folsom Street will be the centerpiece of this new uh, neighborhood and will feature widened sidewalks, views of the bay, cafes, and markets. Watch out for that. That's going to be an exciting, exciting place for the new part of downtown. In our south of market area, the Transbay Terminal will sustain growth in our South Market area, a neighborhood that has grown with the tech companies that call it home. There are more than 1,500 tech companies in San Francisco, as I said earlier, with the center of the city's tech industry located right in that neighborhood. Soma is also home to the Convention Center, which is the centerpiece of our city's tourism. Dreamforce. You know, at the beginning of the month, on September 1st, we held the ninth annual Dreamforce in San Francisco. Dreamforce brought over 40,000 visitors to San Francisco on just a four-day convention. $42.9 million of economic activity went on in our city as a result. It was such a large event that, yeah, we gave them Howard Street. No problem with that. And we'll be doing the same thing with Oracle next week as well. Moscone, for, the, for San Francisco to keep hosting conventions like Dreamforce and Oracle's Open World, it's critical that we expand the Moscone Center's exi existing footprint. And so, through exceedingly careful planning, which includes the establishment of a TID, a revenue source for a planned expansion has been created. 
working with the city and private partners, SF Travel is set to begin an ambitious expansion into Moscone East, which will ensure a vitality of our tourism and convention sector for another generation. The tourism industry supports 67,000 jobs and it generates over $8 billion a year in our economic activity to the city on an annual basis. Okay, how about America's Cup? Tourism will also be supported by the 34th America's Cup, which will bring in breathtaking and short and long-term benefits for our city. An estimated $1.4 billion of economic impact will be to our, our city. But we're also doing it smartly. We're creating positive legacies that will include projects such as an expedited construction of the James R. Herman cruise ship terminal. You know, San Francisco hosts 40 to 80 ships a year, each carrying up to 4,000 passengers who disembark and directly support our economy with their dollars. The terminal, which will also be used as a convention and event space when the ships are not in the port, will prove to be an exceedingly important asset to our local economy in the long run. The jump start provided by the America's Cup is only the beginning of a series of projects that will transform our city's waterfront. These include improvements in transit options, public access infrastructure along the waterfront viewing areas, and an acceleration of other streetscape and waterfront projects that will help show off the beauty of this special part of the city. One example that I'm very interested in, I know John Ram and Ed Riskin was at DBW was, we're very focused on improving our Jefferson Street public realm. That's going to be impacted by uh, this along with parklets and other improvements in our marina, yacht, harbor area. Treasure Island, of, that, of those projects, Treasure Island is the city's largest undertaking. As you know, it's located in our bay and it's a former naval station that ceased operations in 1997. 10 years of planning, the, brown, the groundbreaking will occur early next year, setting the stage for the first residents to appear, additional residents, in 2015. At completion, almost half a million square feet of retail and adaptive reuse of historic structures will happen, and it will complement 8,000 new homes and 300 acres of parks and open space. The project will be built over four phases during about a 15 to 20 year construction period, supporting 10,000 construction jobs, and the resulting neighborhood will support 3,000 permanent positions, a majority of which will be targeted for San Francisco residents. Park Merced is another innovative project that looks to preserve San Francisco's middle income housing stock while creating economic generation for, cities, for our city's western neighborhoods. When complete, 1,500 rent-controlled apartments will be re rebuilt. That's an unprecedented protection to ensure the rights of existing tenants. In addition, in addition to those 1,500 newly rebuilt, 5,500 new homes and 300,000 square feet of commercial space will be added to Park Merced completely through private investment. New development on the west side is a catalyst investment. Park Merced leveraged a Caltrans planning grant, by the way, which may lead to significant capital transportation investment, including separating the M Ocean View from 19th Avenue and extending the Muni Metro to Data City BART. We think that's going to happen. On a Hunters Point shipyard, the San Francisco Southeast Waterfront began its transformation this year as the first phase of the Hunters Point Shipyard Candlestick Project got underway. At full build-out, the neighborhood will include 10,500 homes. A third of the housing will be below market rate, including the rebuilt Alice Griffith Public Housing Development. New companies that are coming into the Hunters Point and Bayview area well, of course, as you know, we opened Fresh and Easy just last month on August 24th. And I opened that Fresh and Easy store in the Bayview to the delight of so many residents to see their first full grocery store service. This is their second store in San Francisco 
The first one was at Clement, and uh, that was opened up on June 20th. In addition to Fresh and Easy, San Francisco's wholesale market produce is located in the Bayview. And that produce market currently houses 30 companies in a 300,000 square foot wholesale marketplace. The produce market is a source of good jobs that pay well and they don't require four-year degrees. The market's 200,000 square feet expansion will generate an additional 350 permanent jobs and $500 million in economic impact, keeping and creating good jobs in San Francisco. Another economic anchor for the community will be a 3 million square foot innovation district for green office space, clean technology, research, and development uses. The district is anticipated to create 10,000 permanent jobs, growth that will benefit the Bayview Hunters Point community as well as the city and the region. As mentioned earlier, Mission Bay, the Hunters Point Innovation District builds upon the success of the city's first innovation cluster, Mission Bay, which was designed from the ground up to be one of the best places on the planet for companies on the cutting edge of new technologies. Thanks to the leadership, of course, of Mayor Brown and Mayor Newsom, we have a good plan that places UCSF's campus, a major research hospital, and private sector companies around it. And it has worked. Today, we have more than 35 life science companies in Mission Bay, including Pfizer, the Pfizer Center for Therapeutic Innovation, Bayer Healthcare, but it's not just limited to biotech. Salesforce, as you know, purchased 1,400 acres in Mission Bay, one of the last vacant parcels in cloud computing. The cloud computing firms that will propose to build some 2 million square feet of their headquarters campus right there, employing 8,000 employees. Now, on to even more exciting news. Seawall Lot 337 and Pier 70 are building on the success of Mission Bay as well. So in addition to winning baseball games, the Giants are working with the port on Seawall Lot 337 that sits across McCovey Cove from the Giants Stadium. It's currently a parking lot, but the site will be transformed into a mixed-use neighborhood that includes a pedestrian promenade along McCovey, uh, McCovey Cove and the Bay. 875 rental homes, exhibit space, new retail, and up to 1.7 million square feet of office and biotech space. Pier 70, this site sits slightly south of the Mission Bay. It's filled with historic buildings that tell of San Francisco's industry, maritime past, including Bethlehem Steel and Union Ironworks Machine Shop. The port and its really development partner, Forest City, will restore 700,000 square feet of historic resources while incorporating 3 million square feet of new office development for tech companies and art organizations. Our California Pacific Medical Center. Clearly another important project is CPMC. In the next year, CPMC will undertake a two and a half billion dollar development project. The project will combine the existing California and Pacific campuses into a new seismically safe hospital on our Cathedral Hill. CPMC will also uphold his commitment to rebuild and operate St. Luke's. We are, with CPMC's partnership, closely working together to ensure that this project will provide all the necessary services to all the residents of San Francisco, especially the poor and underserved. And I expect that this project will get built. Stock options. For a city working so hard to support innovators and create jobs, there's one area that we've got to do better on, and that's our business tax system. It's broken when you have policies that punish job creation. That's what our payroll tax has done. That's what some of the old uh, ordinances that we have on the books uh, have done as well. We took the first step in June to address this problem when I signed legislation that reduces the payroll tax burden on pre-IPO companies' stocks-based compensation for six years. But I'm not done yet. I'm committed to payroll tax reform. Moving away from the payroll tax and working with you, all of you, in our business community as to what should appropriately replace it. 
We make no illusion about this. This is not going to be easy. But I will need your help and everybody in this room's help from the entire business community as well. And I need your help to work with us because the only way we can do this is if we engage each other about the appropriate replacement. And I want to do that with you. All this talk of economic development and job creation brings me back to one of my biggest priorities as your mayor and what I will do and what I will continue to do prior as your prior city minister and now as your mayor. Why all of us do what we want to do here and what we have been doing, we just need to keep families in San Francisco. We need to make sure our workforce, whether they're high tech, whether they're green tech or in the trades or so on, to make sure that people can earn a livable wage, that they can stay here in San Francisco, and we will do what we can to make sure families remain in the city. We can't do it alone without our friends in business, without all of you. We need to work together to make sure San Francisco remains a unique and diverse and innovative place. With our progress in creating San Francisco as an innovative business hub, it's essential that we continue to invest in our residents, our businesses, and our infrastructure. Without this commitment with our partners in the business sector, we're not going to be succeeding. And I want to assure you that you have a grateful mayor every day that's going to work with you to get this done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Lee. So much good news there. Um, John Rahm has been planning director for the city and county of San Francisco since 2008, having come here after five years as planning director for the city of Seattle. All I hear is that was a good hire. So I'm not going to uh, get heavily into his bio. He is at work on a series of comprehensive neighborhood plans, citywide historic resource survey, updates on the general plan, and of course, always ongoing environmental reviews and development reviews. So um, please welcome Planning Director John Rahm. Thank you, Mary. Good morning, everyone. Um, Mr. Mayor, that's a tough act to follow. Uh, you kind of covered my stuff, and I, and I really appreciate that. Um, um, I will say, though, that I will apologize to you because I was not planning on presenting the results of the EIR for America's Cup. Um, I, I, do th I will say, though, and I will make, maintain my promise to you and to the port and to others that we are on track to get it done uh, in November, um, and the Planning Commission is scheduled to act on that EIR in December, um, I think in a record time. Um, so I'm, I'm very proud of that. <clears throat> It's one of those planning geeky things that we do on a daily basis that I know drives many of you crazy. Um, as the mayor said, we are working on a number of bold initiatives and I'm, I was gonna review a couple of those today and, and perhaps get into a little bit of detail on one that I find very exciting, which is the Trans Bay Project, which the mayor mentioned. Um, but I also wanted to start with um, a kind of overview of what's happened over the last, um, if I can get this to work, over the last 10 years or so. Um, we have uh, now, thanks to my uh, predecessor, Dean Macris, and a great staff, and my partners and all the other city departments that are here today, we now have um, plans in place for essentially the, the vast majority of the city where new growth is going to happen. Um, that is something that is important from a number of standpoints. It's important to, to create um, certainty in our planning process and our approval process. It's important that the communities and the planning commission and the mayor and the board understand where we're going. Um, and it's important um, because many of these projects have in fact been approved to the point where, where the development is fully entitled. Specifically, what you see on this map represents over 65,000 new dwelling units, represents space for 110,000 jobs. Ha about half of that number is fully entitled in three major projects, Park Merced, Treasure Island, and Hunters Point Shipyard, thanks to the efforts of not only, of course, of the planning department, but the uh, San Francisco Redevelopment Agency and the Treasure Island Development Authority. That's an incredible accomplishment. 
um, that 30,000 housing units can meet demands that we all know we have a housing crisis in the city and that demand can be met much more easily um, than can be done in the past. In addition, we have plans that, we've pr that we have uh, completed for the, the four neighborhoods of the eastern neighborhoods, Market Octavia, Balboa Park, Visitation Valley, and other areas representing almost 70,000 units. And we have new plans underway uh, for other areas that will complete that cycle. Um, like in other cities, San Francisco's growth will happen on about 15% of the land area of the city. So that 15% is actually where we are, uh, where we have concentrated our planning efforts of the past decade. Um, now, of course, I can sit here and promise you all that having these, these plans approved means that the land use wars and fights at the Planning Commission will go away. Um, and we all know that that will happen, of course, in the coming year. This won't end our land use wars, this won't end fights over EIRs, this won't end appeals, but it does give us all a level of certainty um, about where we are headed, um, both at the community level and at the city level, and I think we should be proud of that. I would like to spend um, a little bit of time uh, talking about the Transit Center plan, partly because I think it's an incredibly exciting project and partly because um, we are about to release the EIR and have a series of discussions about this at the Planning Commission and next year at the board. Um, the plan is to create, as the mayor said, um, a, a dense, sustainable core for downtown in exactly the place that it should be, around the largest transit center in the country outside of New York City. Of course, I need to thank my partners on this, the Transbay uh, Joint Powers Authority and the San Francisco Redevelopment Agency, who have been incredible partners on this effort. Um, and of course, the mayor and uh, both Mayor Lee and Mayor Newsom are huge supporters of this effort, and we are very pleased about that. The plan will encompass the area around the terminal and do what was actually proposed in the 1985 downtown plan, which, to, which is to shift the center of downtown to the south around the terminal exactly where it should be. The investment by the public agencies through the TJPA really gives us the opportunity to do this for the first time, and it fulfills several objectives. It creates a huge new job capacity in our downtown. We, our analysis has been showing that given the downtown build out that we've experienced over the last 30 years, we were, we were uh, getting to a place where we had about a 10 to 20 year capacity for new office space in the downtown. And this plan helps us increase that capacity for several more years. It creates a dense, and, and as I said, perhaps the densest district in the country outside of New York around the terminal that can take advantage of and support the investment made in the terminal. And, and most importantly, perhaps, it actually creates a revenue source for completing the transit center by creating the, the appropriate mechanisms um, to allow the development to help pay for that transportation infrastructure. Um, it actually takes advantage, uh, excuse me, it actually takes advantage not only of the previous parcels that were occupied by the Embarcadero Freeway, but it weaves together this extraordinary engineering effort of bringing transportation into the heart of our downtown in the densest part of the downtown and still creates a great, dense, walkable environment in the process. I should point out that the terminal itself, of course, is the largest multimodal terminal in the country uh, under construction, the Grand Central Station of the West. And I should also point out that the TJPA and the public um, the public sector and, and with your partnership in this city is the only entity in the country that is actually investing real dollars to support high-speed rail. Since the plan would increase heights and density limits in the area, it was important for us to look at the skyline. And this, you'll bear with me on our, my planning, uh, some planning uh, talk for a few seconds. But it was important for us to look at when we talk about buildings up to 1,000 feet, what this actually will do to our skyline, what it will look like, how to maintain and actually make more distinct the city's skyline. The city skyline today, of course, is characterized uh, by what we, what we most see is the Transamerica building, the Bank of America, and in the far right, the Rincon Towers, and in the center, a kind of benching of a lot of similarly height buildings. Um, the terminal um, and the project at Transit Center will create a new focal point for the city in exactly the places where it should be. Um, and create a kind of new heart of downtown um, south of Market, which is exactly where we have been thinking it should go for the last 25 years. Um, as seen from Treasure Island as well, the idea is to really create a, a punctuated skyline with the 1,000-foot tower at the, at the transit center 
um, and with the endpoints of the Rincon Towers on the left and the Transamerica Pyramid on the right. I think importantly, it's also important to mention what this will actually result. Under current zoning, um, there is about six million square feet of office space uh, that is possible. We will be adding over two million square feet of that um, so that the total that we get be between office, housing, uh, retail, and hotel spaces is almost nine million square feet, um, which is about a four million square foot increment over what current zoning allows for us. I think there, that it's important to recognize that this is being built not in some far distant part of the city, but in exactly the part of, parts of the city where high rises exist today and where, where we have the transportation infrastructure to support it. It will include major improvements to the streets and sidewalks, which we know we desperately needed in that area. And it will also include 11 acres of public parks, over half of which is on the roof of the terminal that is being built by the TJPA. And importantly, it will also include a funding mechanism to help pay for all of this. Um, through the Mellow Roos mechanism, which we know we have used in Mission Bay and which works and which is heavily supported by many of you who have built in that area, we can realize a net present value of over a quarter billion dollars to support the transit center uh, through the development in, in, in the area, as well as uh, fees which will help support the, the park and open space improvements over time. Moving on from Trans Bay, I just wanted to mention a couple of other plans and projects um, that we are working on, in particular, um, the Central Corridor. Uh, the Central Corridor is our name for the planning effort that we are focusing on along 4th Street to support and be supported by the investment that the city is making in the Central Subway. This is an area of town that is kind of sandwiched between downtown, western, western Soma, uh, the Tenderloin, and is also an area that is going to see tremendous interest and growth and development over the next couple of years. The central, um, here is with Transbay, we are trying to capitalize on the transit investment, but here, rather than, on, um, rather than in some of the recent plans such as Rincon, Hill, and other high-density residential areas, our focus is going to be on job-producing space. As you have all seen, and as we've seen with the rents now being realized south of market, we believe there is a growing demand for companies who want to be in the city but who do not want to be in a downtown high rise. This gives them an option. And as, and as Mission Bay gets built out and with a project with Salesforce and other projects that you know about, um, we believe this is an incredible opportunity to accommodate businesses who want to be in the city, want to be in large floor plate offices, want to be on the edge of downtown but not in downtown. And we are already seeing tremendous interest in this area in a number of ways. We're going to be looking for your help and support in this planning effort over the next couple of years. We believe this is an important next step in the city's growth. Um, and, in, uh, and in working with that neighborhood and with all of you, we think this plan can be realized by the end of next year. Finally, I want to make a plug for our recently adopted Better Streets plan. The Better Streets plan is a plan that really covers that area that development does not occur on. Uh, which is that those areas of our city that are occupied by our streets and rights of way. This is 25% of the land area of our city. It occupies more land than all the city's parks combined. It's important for us to do this right. The plan, this plan that was adopted by the board last year actually creates a, a template and a, and a guide for how we create better streets that are walkable, more bike friendly, more sustainable and greener. Um, it is, uh, it is the, the guideline for what has turned out to be a successful series of I think we're approaching an interesting new era in the city's history. I, I think the projects that the mayor talked about, the projects that you'll hear about today, um, are projects that truly met, represent a new era in the city's history. I'm also seeing in my four and a half years, three, th almost four years here. Um, we're also seeing a, an interesting new, um, I think, dynamism in the city and in city government that I just have to make mention of. My colleagues here, Monique uh, Moyer, Ed Riskin, Jennifer Matz, and others, have really um, formed a partnership to really recognize the, the, the benefits and the value of working together. As was said earlier, it, uh, all things are connected, and it is my job to make sure that we connect those things that we are all working on 
and making sure that it leads to a, a, a stronger growth, more equitable and sustainable growth for the city in the future. I'm optimistic, um, and I think um, that I would like to uh, uh, ask you all to join us in that optimism in the future. Thank you. John, thank you, and we appreciate the connecting of all these dots for us. We asked Charlie Millay if he would talk about the Twitter effect on Market Street and why Shorenstein has made such a significant bet on mid-market with its purchase of the former San Francisco Furniture Mart um, that is now going to house Twitter headquarters. So just a quick, Charlie Mill Millay has been with Shorenstein since 95. He oversees and manages all of the company's acquisition, disposition activity, and the investment performance of all of the assets throughout the United States. Um, big job, bigger than I'm just describing, but he's really uh, looking at the whole investment performance and package of all properties for Shorenstein. So great to have his perspectives on mid-market and the real estate market. Please welcome Charlie Millay from Shorenstein. Well, uh, thank you, and I'm glad I'm speaking ahead of the America's Cup because I can imagine that their presentation is going to be tenfold what mine's going to be, so please hang with me here. Um, to try to give context to mid-market, I thought I'd just say a few words about um, San Francisco in general. Um, it's a quick, easy slide, but vacancy rate in San Francisco right now is slightly above 13%. This is citywide. Um, if you go sub-market to sub-market, it can change quite a bit. Um, the low point, which for landlords was the best of times, was 2007. We had a single digit vacancy, and obviously in that period of time you're going to see some rental rate growth. Um, we've been pretty fortunate as far as uh, cities across America go that we've had four positive quarters of absorption now. Absorption really measures um, the underlying size of the office using tenant base. In San Francisco, what that really means is job creation in the office using sector. We obviously could use a few more quarters of positive absorption. Uh, you know, vacancy rates, once they get to around 10%, you see equilibrium between landlords and tenants. They are on equal footing. Um, whoops, sorry. This next slide here shows leasing velocity. And leasing velocity really is a measurement of, can be a good um, measurement of what people are feeling about the business climate. Uh, when things are slow and you're in a recessionary period, um, most tenants are uncertain about their business future and they'll put off making major financial decisions. A lease is a major financial decision, often for five to ten years. Um, what we saw in 2007 is hardly anything got done in the leasing market. And it's not surprising if you go back many cycles, that's usually what happens. But what we've seen in the last year and a half is a greater clarity of business future for many of the occupants in San Francisco, and they're willing to make financial commitments. And so um, Shorenstein saw this as uh, an indicator that the market was starting to turn. In contrast to that was mid-market. So depending on how you draw the lines of various submarkets, mid-market usually gets thrown into the Civic Center or Van Ness Corridor submarket. It's clearly the hardest hit section of San Francisco. Historically, it was always very well leased. It was buoyed by um, government, both uh, federal government and city government, and then large corporations. But in the last several years, you've had a, a large move out from AAA of close to 400,000 square feet. State comp was 350,000 square feet. Over time, Bank of America has moved out of close to a million square feet. And then you had the exodus of the West Coast Merchandise Mart um, at Market Square, which was a million square feet. So this market really is um, uh, a challenge right now. And so you'd think, well, then why invest there? But we saw it as an opportunity um, to do something uh, that was a little bit unique for us. Uh, we could put all of the resources of the Shorenstein organization to work in one asset in our backyard and hopefully make a difference for the neighborhood. We also saw it as an area of town that the mayor who spoke to today, um, he's out in front of this. this he's made this uh, a very important plank in his platform 
And um, it's not often that you're, you've got the opportunity to be alongside a city government that's really helping a blighted area or a troubled area to pull out of it. <clears throat> if I focus on where it is for a second, Market Square is a full city block between 9th and 10th Street. Um, what we like about this is the investment that has already happened in the neighborhood. Over the last five years, there's been about 2,500 residential units uh, developed in the neighborhood, and over the next five years, there's uh, 1,500 to 2,000 slated to be developed. Um, I think the largest of which is the Crescent Heights project at the corner of 10th and Market. Um, I believe it's a two uh, tower property for 750 units of for rent residential. I'm told that uh, the first units will be available uh, in 24 to 30 months. So that's pretty exciting. And uh, it's a neighborhood that I think um, will really turn the corner over the next five to seven years once you see all this residential built. What we've seen nationwide um, is a, a movement towards properties that are a little bit different than the high-rise Class A office space. What we've seen are tenants, particularly young tech tenants, want to differentiate their companies by going into creative office space. And uh, it's a, a whole combination of things. They want you know, wide open floor plates, uh, high ceilings. They want something that's a little bit different than being in a rectangle cube. But they also want to be in an environment that has a close proximity to housing, it's on public transportation, and ideally, over time, would be supported by amenities that allows them to have this you know, live, work, lifestyle in close proximity. And we think that over time, mid-market will allow that. Market Square is a two-building complex, about 1.1 million square feet of space. Uh, the larger of the two buildings is 1355 Market. It was originally constructed in 1938. It was added on to in the 40s, again in the 50s, again in the 60s, and finally in the 70s. Today it's 11 stories, about 750,000 square feet. Um, the second property to this project is 875 Stevenson. I don't have a good picture of uh, 875 Stevenson. I don't think there is a good picture of 875 Stevenson. <laughs> So uh, that's going to be our next challenge, kind of phase two of the project, is uh, we're looking at reskinning that property so it um, is something that is a little more attractive than it is today. But uh, phase one, 1355 market, we're pretty excited about. Um, it's a property that we were fortunate enough to have Twitter uh, become interested in, and, and with the mayor's help, we were able to get a lease transaction done at the property. Um, I, I've got to thank Twitter for being a good corporate citizen and uh, being willing to come to a neighborhood that uh, historically is not one that people are looking to go to, but I think over time uh, it'll really be main in main for a lot of tech tenants in San Francisco. Um, they've taken 220,000 square feet and hopefully over time they'll even double in size. The property, if you haven't had a chance to tour it, um, please give either myself or Jim Collins or Tom McDonald at the Shorenstein Company a call. We'd be happy to bring you through. But what's really neat about this property is um, there's a, an opportunity for us to blend old architecture, many Art Deco touches throughout the property with brand new infrastructure and turn it into a Class A office building. Um, again, we, we've had some success in New York City with a property called the Starrett Lehigh Building. Um, where it was a 2.3 million square foot former industrial building that was converted into office space and it's been you know, very well received and tremendously successful over the years. We've also seen other uh, developers do projects like this in Chicago, elsewhere in New York, and there's plenty, plenty examples of it here in San Francisco. We think Market Square is a, a unique opportunity for us um, Again, to put to work all the Shorenstein resources. Um, the, the property over the last five years has been close to 100% vacant. There are a few city uses in there now, um, but it really has been struggling since the Merchandise Mart left. And uh, the Shorenstein brand is a, a national real estate investor, but really I think our brand uh, is the strongest here in San Francisco where the roots of the company are. And so, um, 
here we have an opportunity to invest uh, at least $80 million into a renovation and um, you know, spend a lot of time leasing the property, something we've been able to do over good cycles, bad cycles in San Francisco. And the space is definitely different. This is not what the Shorenstein Company is typically known for doing, but as I say, we've had success in other markets doing it. And we think that there's this big demand sector that's growing in San Francisco for creative office space. It's not just tech, it's advertising, it's architectural firms, it's consulting. And uh, so we're pretty excited about the project. Lastly, um, I, I think that uh, what really made us keenly interested in this project is an opportunity for a brand name company like Shorenstein to make a significant investment into a troubled area in San Francisco. And again, we're very thankful to Twitter for hanging in there with us. And um, I think that they legitimized the project. It's proof of concept from day one. And I think that there'll be a Pied Piper for other tech firms to come to the neighborhood that will benefit not only us, but the surrounding buildings in the neighborhood that are struggling with some vacancy right now. And um, you know, I encourage everyone to come by and see our project. And I hope that in five years' time, we have a lot of residential surrounding us and a well-leased property. And it's something that the city, the mayor's office, and the Shorenstein Company can be very proud of. So thank you for your time today. And Twitter moves in in mid-2012, and I think we'll really see that as such a transformative catalyst to that region, so thank you. Well, in addition to the Twitter effect on mid-market, there's no doubt that um, the Salesforce.com announcement for the Mission Bay, massive Mission Bay campus headquarters um, had a big effect. And in fact, I heard a broker over at China Basin saying he was playing a lot of golf before that happened, and his hair was kind of on fire after that. So many deals, you know, as a result of the excitement that created and the synergy. So um, again, I'm not going to, uh, you've heard a lot about it, and now we're going to get a little depth and really what this very um, sense of place that's going to be created uh, at this wonderful campus. So. Please welcome uh, Bruce Francis, who's Chief Messaging Officer at Salesforce.com. He'll describe the unique design and characteristics and some of the impact that this uh, campus in Mission Bay is, is going to have. It's certainly going to mean a lot of jobs. He's responsible, Bruce Francis is responsible for helping define and shape Salesforce.com's strategic direction worldwide and has helped lead the launch of almost every Salesforce.com product since he joined the company in 2004. Please welcome Bruce Francis to talk about Salesforce.com at Mission Bay. Good morning. Uh, it's great to be here to have a chance to talk about a project that is going to be core to San Francisco, we hope, and it's very important to the future success of Salesforce.com. So I want to take a couple of minutes and. Uh, just uh, familiarize you with the company because I find that wherever we go in San Francisco, we're still introducing ourselves, which is a great uh, position to be in. So let me uh, get a show of hands. Do I have any customers in the room? Any Salesforce customers? The rest of you are prospects in our view. So, <laughs> so uh, I ho hope you'll uh, pay attention to uh, the next few minutes. Uh, just a couple slides on what Salesforce is. Of course, anytime we speak anywhere, we're a publicly traded company. So I uh, just want to remind you of our safe harbor statement. If you can't read it all there right now, uh, why don't you take a look at it? It's on our website, and we encourage you to go there and check it out. Well, every company, of course, has a mission. And our mission at Salesforce.com is to be the evangelist of cloud computing. Now, how many people are, are familiar with the term cloud computing? All right, well, if you've ever used Amazon.com, if you have a Gmail account, you've used cloud computing. We've been using it in our personal lives for quite some time, but it's really taking over how businesses manage, share their information, and increasingly collaborate. Whoop, sorry. 
And uh, we've been growing at a rapid rate since we were founded in 1999. Uh, we've recently passed the $2.1 billion annual, rev annual revenue run rate mark. And we have about 102,000 customers worldwide. And it's just this kind of growth that we've been experiencing that is behind our drive to build uh, the new campus. We need to attract and retain the smartest uh, software engineers, the best salespeople, the most kick-ass marketers we can get so then they will have a home for future success in San Francisco. Now, the cloud computing model has really taken off with businesses because it's got a few key attributes that really everyone can uh, relate to. It, first of all, it's multi-tenant, just as in the way it is, uh, I don't have to tell a real estate crowd this, that uh, you'll have multiple tenants in a commercial or real estate uh, building, each having its own discrete space, but sharing key services that they don't have to worry about. They can assume the plumbing, the electrical, the elevators, all the key uh, services are there, yet you have your own private, secure uh, operation. And that's the way it works in the cloud with business information. Of course, you get automatic upgrades. What version of Amazon.com do you use? What version of Gmail? You don't know. It's always there, right? Always the best version with the most features that's easiest to use with all your customizations, always there. That's true for Salesforce and cloud computing as well. It works in real time much faster than what you'd come uh, to expect from enterprise software. How many times have you been on the phone with a uh, customer service help desk and they've said, oh, my computer's running a little slow today. I've got to wait for a reason. That is the slow lack of real-time capability that you find in traditional enterprise software. Uh, Salesforce.com during this period of growth has become the enterprise standard for cloud computing. We serve very large businesses, but we also find that over time our own mix has been pretty stable as between a third, a third, a third, small, medium, and large companies. What isn't known is how efficient cloud computing is in the consumption of resources. A company building its own and maintaining its own private data center, tremendously inefficient. Uses a tremendous amount of electricity to heat, cool, and just uh, build in all the redundancy. Cloud computing, because it's a shared resource, it is much, much more efficient and much greener than typical uh, enterprise technology. We are proud of the fact that we've been recognized by just about every uh, analyst firm, every technology uh, publication in the world. Most recently, in August, Forbes magazine called Salesforce.com the most innovative company in the world, and we're grateful for that recognition. But I think most important to our identity uh, as a company is the Salesforce.com foundation. That was founded at moment one, when Mark, Parker, Frank, and Dave got together in that uh, hotel room, rather that uh, apartment on um, Telegraph Hill. They decided they were gonna set aside 1% of the employee time, 1% of the company's equity, and 1% of the product would be available to nonprofits to help them manage their organizations. Over time, that's meant more than 270,000 employee hours. Now remember, we're still a very small company. Those are impressive numbers, and 12,000 uh, nonprofits globally. And of course, in San Francisco, it's been a particular focus for us, and we help run uh, nonprofits like the Great Family Services Agency, which has been working with the city's uh, mental health uh, uh, patients here and help them, them track outcomes and actually deliver services more efficiently. So we're very proud of that. Now, the big idea that Salesforce is about right now is something uh, that we're seeing in our daily lives. How many people have a Twitter account or a Facebook page or something like that? Let me see a show of hands. Well, yeah, just about everyone here does. But when you get to work, you're not seeing that, right? Some companies are kind of listening in on what's going on on Twitter, or they might have a, a Facebook page for the company. But the information that customers are using and sharing with each other on the outside somehow never gets in to the systems you use in the business. So this is what we're calling the social divide. And our solution is something called the social enterprise, 
where, every, where it all starts with a customer social profile so that you get a complete view of what the customer is doing on social networks, their interactions with, other, with your products, their statements about what's going on in their lives. We've got a little structural failure here on the, on the podium. Uh, I, won't, I won't take a lot of time and get into this uh, concept here of the social enterprise, but we think it's gonna change the way companies manage and share information and collaborate both internally and with their customers in the future. And I encourage you, if uh, any of you are interested in her hearing a little bit more about this, we'd be happy to uh, arrange a meeting uh, with, your, with your teams to see how we could help you manage your company. So let's take a look at salesforce.com and Mission Bay. Uh, as I mentioned, we're a fast-growing company, and we need to plan for the next phase of growth. We have about 6,500 uh, 6, employees uh, worldwide right now, and we need to find a place that will uh, be their home for the next few years. And in fact, uh, we're realizing right now that we are going to need to take some interim space, uh, substantial interim space in San Francisco to meet the gap, because building a a uh, new campus from square one is gonna take some time. So here's uh, the uh, plot that uh, we're talking about over here on uh, Mission Bay. This is uh, the designated area, and this is what um, you see the Legoretta and Legoretta designs uh, put in um, into the uh, current picture. The main feature of the campus, maybe you've seen a little bit of this in the San Francisco Business Times or maybe the Chronicle, is the town square. Unlike a lot of technology campuses, we wanted to build a campus that brings the city into our campus and our campus into the city. We felt that that interaction was very important. It's good for our employees. It's good for uh, the city as well. We're not gonna build an employee cafeteria. Uh, we are not going to uh, separate our employees from the city. That interaction is healthy. It builds a neighborhood, not just uh, a campus. And I think, and the uh, reaction that we've had from the Citizens Advisory Committee in Mission Bay has been just terrific. We don't want to build an open, unused um, plaza either. So you, uh, so you see these designs incorporate private spaces, covered spaces, intimate spaces within this large public square. Of course, water, because we're on the waterfront, is a continuing theme that you'll see throughout uh, the Salesforce campus. And uh, as we mentioned earlier, sustainability is a very key uh, value for us. We are seeking LEED Platinum certification for the uh, new campus. Uh, we'll have a number of sustainable features here. We're exploring them all now in our design phase, including geothermal, chilled beam, and solar panels on the roof. Uh, we also, of course, want to just take advantage of the old-fashioned sustainable uh, ideas, like using natural light to uh, flood the spaces and have windows that really open uh, to uh, provide ventilation. Um, we uh, are very, very keen on uh, investigating new technologies as well for power generation right on site including some of the ones that I've talked about already. So this is a view of one of the interiors, bringing some of those key themes in, drawing the light down and inside, making for a, a very green and stimulating environment. Um, you also have seen throughout uh, these designs the uh, Legoretta and Legoretta approach, which has been to create uh, buildings that share a common theme and relationship to one another but are not uniform in shape and size. And this is a view along the Third Street quarter, the quarter that gives you a good idea of the massing uh, that you'll see. We're not building tall towers here. We want large uh, floor plates to uh, encourage collaboration between employees. And we're making liberal use of color. We, uh, I think that was one reason we clicked with Legoretta and Legoretta from the very beginning, that we saw um, the uh, desire to reflect in this new campus the kind of color that we see e everywhere in San Francisco. This is not going to be boring gra gray granite and green glass architecture, I promise you. Here are a couple of other views that you see of the splashes of color. 
and I hope you will follow up with us and uh, give us your questions. And I will leave you with a couple more views. I, I particularly love uh, this uh, purple tower. I, I call that the cheese grater. I don't, I, I don't know what, uh, what Victor Legoretta's key uh, uh, term for that is. And here we are uh, stepping back uh, along Terry France, uh, Francois from the water. And you can see that uh, as, as opposed, uh, as you see in some European cities, we have very tall buildings uh, hogging all the views of the water. We step back very gracefully from the waterfront. Uh, the project team, uh, partly in place, uh, led by my colleague Ford Fish. Ford, where are you? I know you, right over here. Man, oh, and Tim Alonzo's here too, great. So if you have questions for uh, Ford and the team, uh, they're here. And feel free to reach out to me, Facebook, Twitter, salesforce.com. Look forward to talking with you more about this, or of course, the social enterprise. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. What a gorgeous, gorgeous campus. Very excited to see that come to fruition. And who knows where the next Salesforce might be lurking in the incubator of San Francisco. So you heard the mayor say it, the CPMC uh, Cathedral Hill Hospital cancel, uh, campus shall uh, be. Um, it will be the largest construction project private construction project coming into San Francisco at, I think, $2.5 billion, pumping much-needed fuel and jobs into the economy. Dr. Warren Browner is going to share with us about the impact and, and what that will look like. He is the CEO of California Pacific Medical Center. It's the largest hospital in San Francisco and part of the Sutter Health System. He's been here since 1975 when he came to attend medical school at UCSF, got his Master's of Public Health from UC Berkeley. And uh, he still holds an appointment as adjunct professor of epidemiology and biostatistics on the UCSF faculty. But you can find him in his gym clothes most Saturdays around 1 p.m. buying produce at the farmer's market on 24th Street in Noy Valley. A great uh, leader in our community, Dr. Warren Browner, CEO of CPMC. Thanks, Mary. Actually, it's a very sad time for me because the stone fruit season is about to end. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to try to be respectful of your time because I know I'm standing between you and the incredible presentation on the America's Cup filled with more rumbling bass than you'll hear outside a movie theater. So, um, But I do want to remind all of you that we, you probably saw the recent report showing how vital hospitals are to the health of San Francisco. We are actually, all the hospitals put together, the largest single industry in town beating out tourism and responsible for almost 100,000 jobs here in the city. Um, you, you notice my little plug here. Uh, we are a community benefit for, for San Francisco, although I have to confess we've only been around since 1854. Um, all four of our campuses actually got started more than 100 years ago, um, back in the 19th century. And um, although none of the, those original buildings are still standing, we do face a seismic challenge here in the city that although many of us prefer to make believe um, you know, doesn't exist, actually, of course, still does exist. Um, we um, are responsible for 30% uh, of the inpatient beds in the city um, and the ER visits. We care for about 40% of everybody who gets um, health care here in the city and we deliver half the babies in San Francisco. So if you think there are very few children in San Francisco relative to the number of dogs, imagine how many fewer there would be if we weren't busy helping bring new life uh, to the city every year. Um, we provide every year more than $100 million in care for uninsured and underinsured patients, including 20% of the participants in Healthy San Francisco, the nationally leading health program that um, Mayor Newsom and Mitch Katch introduced. Um, and we actually provide free care, free care, which we call charity care, for anybody who comes to our hospitals who earns less than 400% of the federal poverty level, um, a, a true benefit for the, uh, uh, the poor of San Francisco, as well as um, nearly $60 million a year for education and research projects. We are uh, the second largest private employer in San Francisco with 6,200 full-time jobs 
at an average salary of $85,000 a year. These are good jobs working in healthcare, and that doesn't include full benefits, and yes, we do provide employer-paid health coverage for employees and their dependents. Um, we inject about $1.4 billion into the economy every year, and in addition to the people who directly work for us, we create nearly 2,200 either indirect or induced jobs as a result of what we're doing here in the city. We're an important part uh, of what keeps the city vibrant. We also have about 2,000 doctors on our medical staffs um, who provide an additional 3,500 jobs and nearly a third of a, more than a third of a billion dollars in benefit to the city. And we've proposed two rather audacious rebuild projects, one um, at the corner of NS and Geary um, and another uh, a new hospital on our St. Louis campus, as well as new medical office buildings at three of our campuses, including our existing campus at Davies. And I'm sure you're all basically familiar with those projects and where they, uh, what they're going to look like. Um, we've already spent nearly a half a million dollars getting ready for this, buying land and doing construction design, um, and we're about to spend two billion more dollars as soon as we get the green light. Let me say that one more time. As soon as we get the green light, we actually have the, the financing in hand. You can imagine how many new construction jobs, and we've gotten great support from the building trades, um, and what that's going to generate in terms of uh, additional benefits for the city. So here's my quiz for you. You got a clue as to what this might be for Mary's introduction. Anybody have any idea what this is? If speak up if you do. I'm, I'm, I will tell you in a moment. So uh, what this is, is the future of healthcare. It's a pictorial representation of the baby boomer bulge. So in the purplish red color are the baby boomers. I will not ask for a show of hands, although I can see just by looking out here how many of us belong to this baby boomer bulge. And why does this matter if you're in healthcare? Because as us boomers age into that, oh, those upper levels of the 65 plus and the 80 plus, et cetera, we will, of course, need much more health care. So health care is absolutely a growth industry, both here in California and elsewhere in the world. Now, the good news about this, by the way, for those of you familiar with demographics, is look how many people are in blue below the baby boomers in California. So unlike many other states and countries, where there's nobody left to support us as we become decrepit. In fact, <laughs> California is in very good shape, uh, largely, by the way, as a result of our immigration over the last 20 years. That has populated um, the state with people who are going to be working while the rest of us spend our time retired um, and getting health care. So I mentioned that we're a growth industry where there's going to be a major construction surge. We're actually a green-ing industry. I would hardly describe hospitals as being green, yet we consume enormous amounts of energy to keep hospitals running, but we are becoming more efficient. And of course, I need to tell nobody here about how important we are in terms of biomedical research and biotech innovation. So what challenges do we face? Like all of you involved in development, Entitlements here in the city is a challenge for us, and I can't imagine how much more difficult it would be for us if it were not for the profound support we've received from the mayor, the planning department, and the mayor's staff. So I want to thank them publicly for their efforts on our behalf. Um, another challenge, though, that we frankly face is that the project has been delayed and is likely to face appeals in the future. The benefit we've had from the recession is that the cost of building our projects has not been increasing as rapidly as it was, say, five or ten years ago. But as the economy recovers, there's no doubt that construction costs are going to go up. And every month of delay in terms of us getting started is probably costing us about $5 million. And that's money that we currently actually don't have. But I want to conclude with um, a real challenge that I think all of us in this room face, and that's the de definition of what we call community benefit. Because when I came to San Francisco 36 years ago, almost to the day to start medical school, I naively assumed that healthcare and hospitals open 24-7, 365 to take care of people were a community benefit. But what we've done here in San Francisco, unfortunately, I think is defined community benefit much too narrowly and to include things like affordable housing or bicycle lanes. And we forget that we are all part of this community. 
And the danger of a narrow definition is not only does it make the entitlements process more difficult, but it also threatens the, the support that we provide for community services that all of us benefit from. And it makes the lives of, of the folks who run our government more difficult when we're not there to support things like parks and transportation and schools, which benefit all of us as long as we remember we're all part of the same community here in San Francisco. So I leave you with that thought. Remember what brought me here to San Francisco and what kept me here, what, why I raised my family here, is because we are a relatively unique community. We need to keep that in mind as we move forward over the next 10, 20, 30, 50, and even 100 years. Thank you. doing a little reporting there. Um, it, you know, the, the hospital will start in 2012 and could be built if all went well in five years. So think of, of that impact. And thank you, Dr. Browner. Now for the big rumbling wow in San Francisco's near future and on, you know, will have an impact on well into the future. We're going to hear from Tom Houston, who is Chief Operating Officer of the America's Cup Event Authority. Uh, before Tom comes up here, uh, we're going to have a little video. And uh, anyway, uh, let me give you just quick about Tom. He's responsible for developing and executing the strategy that synergizes all of the commercial operations of the 34th America's Cup. Huge history in managing all aspects of major international sports events. I won't get into that. He's going to give us his views on what this great event is going to bring to our city. So let's see this exciting video for the America's Cup.
hopefully that, uh, hopefully that woke everyone up. Um, with all the pressure that my predecessors have put upon me for this uh, presentation, it's always good to start with a cool video to uh, help, uh, help take some of that pressure off. Um, before I get started, uh, you know, we are on a very aggressive timeline to achieve our objectives, and it wouldn't be possible without this great support we've been receiving from the mayor and from the ports and from our uh, other constituents in the city. And I uh, just want to thank them quickly for all of their uh, help and hard work. Um, you know, we uh, have got a lot of things that still have to get done by the end of the year in order to achieve these goals and uh, really get started in January in order to reach our uh, 2013 deadlines. So it's, uh, it's only possible with their support, and uh, we thank them very much. Um, okay, so much has been uh, written about the economic impact, and uh, I'm actually not going to talk about that. Uh, what I am going to talk about, however, is uh, to help put this event in context to a certain extent, and uh, also then share a little bit with you about our plans uh, for what's going to be happening in the city over the next couple of years. Um, the, the America's Cup uh, is 160 years old. It just recently had its birthday. It is the oldest organized sporting competition in the modern world. It uh, predates the Olympics, as we know them. Um, with such a great tradition in history uh, comes a great responsibility on our shoulders to help reinvent the America's Cup brand for the future and to help bring it back to its glory days of the 1980s when everyone pretty much knew what the America's Cup was when Dennis Conner was uh, busy losing it for the first time uh, in its 150-year history. Um, and so to help us achieve that, uh, San Francisco you know, is, is the perfect choice. Um, part of our mission and part of our strategy in order to make it popular and to bring it back to the masses is actually to allow the masses to have access to it. And so a lot of what you're going to hear me talk about in some of the slides I'll show you will really be about public access and how for the first time in the history of the Cup, this event is going to be able to be seen by live spectators as opposed to taking place many, many miles offshore. Another uh, point of context, this is not just a San Francisco event, this is not just a California event. Um, the America's Cup represents the third largest economic impact of any sporting event in the world. Number one would be the FIFA World Cup, number two would be the Olympics, and number three is the America's Cup. And the last time the United States has hosted a major international sporting event was 2002 Salt Lake. Uh, that was now, by the time we arrive, it will have been 10 years. Uh, the Olympics are now booked for at least the next 10 to 12 years. And as we know, the World Cup is also not coming back to the United States, at least until after 2020, which means this is the only game in town in the United States uh, and is pretty special and something that we should all be very proud of for that very reason. Okay, we've created a program that allows us to take the America's Cup around the world and promote San Francisco globally, everywhere we go. Uh, if you think of it in terms of Final Four, uh, road to the Final Four, um, our road to San Francisco is taking place now. Uh, our first taste uh, and the first glimpse that we'll be able to share with everyone uh, is August of next year. We will be here for the America's Cup World Series. And uh, that event will take place um, over a nine to nine, nine day to, uh, to six week period. There are two events planned. We don't have the final exact date scheduled yet, but that, uh, it will be announced very shortly. Then after 2012, we'll be back again in July of 2013 for the Louis Vuitton Cup. And to put it again into sort of United States sports uh, analogy, um, you think of the America's Cup World Series almost as the regular season. You think of the Louis Vuitton Cup almost as the playoffs. And the America's Cup itself is the final that will take place over the three-week period in September. Now, with the only caveat being that in America's Cup sailing, the, uh, the winner, the defender, is automatically in the final. So the United States will be in the final no matter what. We can't get kicked out early, which is nice. <laughs> As in other sports. Um, again, part of our strategy about bringing this back to the masses and bringing this back to the public is that, again, for the first time in history, we're able to have the racing in front of people. And the San Francisco Amphitheater uh, is our stadium. There is no better natural location for this event in the world. Consistent winds every single day that you can plan a broadcast schedule around, um, fantastic viewing opportunities, and of course, a wonderful waterfront that we are going to help redevelop, uh, which will be part of our lasting legacy. Now, for 2012, because there'll be a lot of work happening on the pier areas, we will have our America's Cup World Series debut uh, here, and the Marina Green will be the center of that activity. 
Uh, this is where people will be able to come down and, uh, and have, you know, have a look and, and feel the atmosphere. There will be some of the same things that we'll be doing on a much larger scale in 2013, such as live entertainment, such as uh, you know, family uh, hospitality, uh, corporate hospitality, um, and, and really all of this sort of race activities happening just right in front of your eyes, just a few meters offshore. Um, part of this concept is, as we said, unprecedented access. You know, this is free for the public in, in the vast majority of the areas. It's, uh, it's bringing the America's Cup to a whole new level of access for people that hasn't, uh, hasn't been able to experience it before. And I can say that our concept and our approach has been validated. Uh, we have had two fantastic events, the most recent of which was Plymouth, England, that just concluded last Sunday. And the results were Fantastic, absolutely brilliant. We had over 10,000 people per day uh, crowding into, the, into our event area, uh, into our little amphitheater that we had there. It, it's very similar to what we have here in San Francisco, but there were over 10,000 people per day during the week, and we had over 20,000 people on the weekends. It was a fantastic crowd, and seriously, the, the, uh, the reaction from the people was absolutely brilliant. I mean, people were cheering the uh, sailors, cheering the athletes. You know, this, this is really all about, uh, about going back to creating a, a proper sport around this event. This is not luxury yachting, this is hardcore athletics, and these guys are serious athletes, and the fans really, really were able to appreciate that, and it was extremely exciting. Uh, San Francisco for 2012 again, um, because of the fact that some of the other areas I'll talk about in a second will be under development, we will have our team base area uh, at Pier 80. Um, this will be the temporary side of the team bases, and to give you a glimpse of how that will look, uh, this is what it looked like in Qashqais. Uh, the team bases is effectively our pit row. Uh, you know, we think of ourselves as Formula One on the water. And this is a hugely, hugely popular area for the public. Uh, this is where you can really walk down, you can see what the teams are doing, you can have a, a glimpse of what this operation is all about. It generates huge crowds, you get to be close to the boats, you really get a sense of, of what this is all about, and it's, it's one of our key drawing, uh, drawing points. Um, which means that this Pier 80 area will have some attention drawn to it that it hasn't had in the past. And so it's also um, something that I think is, is good for future plans for that, uh, that location. Then as the mayor showed you earlier, uh, this is the uh, heart of the event in 2013. This is 27-29. Um, this is really the focal point. Uh, in fact, the finish line for the event extends off of this pier, and you can sort of see it on the diagram a little bit. It's not just a vapor trail extending from one of those boats. That is actually the finish line of the race. So this is really where the core of activity will take place. Again, it's, it's open to the public. There will be entertainment. There will be corporate opportunities. Um, it, it's really going to be our, our ground zero, if you will, for, um, sorry, Anna, I forgot. I've been speaking in Europe for a long time. Not ground zero. <laughs> This is going to be our heart and our core of the event, um, and it's going to be a very exciting place to be. Uh, we also have other places in the city, however, that we're working on, and that's part of the process we're going through, where we will still have activities down at Chrissy Field. We hope to be on Marina Green um, and, and other viewing points throughout the city. I mean, we're, we're hoping that we're going to have really fantastic and huge crowds around this event. And as we also mentioned earlier, someone pointed out the fact that, you know, part of our, part of our uh, impact and is, is that this is, this is over three months, if we look at it, in 2013 from the time the races first begin until we're finished. You know, we begin in, uh, in June, we finish at, uh, towards the end of September. So it's really pretty, uh, pretty exciting. Um, OK. Uh, 3032 is where the team bases will be uh, for, for 2013. And this area will be ready. Uh, the teams will be able to come and get their bases set up well in advance of the events and start doing training activities here. Um, this also is open to the public again. This is, uh, the, you know, there'll be merchandise opportunities. There'll be, again, the ability to get close to the boats, close to the action, close to, you know, what's going on and really be in the event. So, again, our message is really all about open access, about drawing attention to this, allowing as many people as possible to interact with it and to be a part of it. And, um, you know, and that includes, of course, the residents of the area as well as the, you know, the, I think it's 10 million or so tourists that uh, Pier 39 alone gets every year. So, you know, this is really going to be a, a calling card now. And again, we're promoting all of this everywhere we go around the world with the America's Cup World Series so that people are aware of all the great things that will be happening in San Francisco. Um, just to wrap up, the uh, ex action is all available on americascup.com. If you would like to have a glimpse or a first taste of what we're going to be bringing, you can come and join us in San Diego. We're going to be there from the 12th to the 20th of November, so just in a few weeks' time. Uh, there are plenty of opportunities as well, again, to uh, participate either on the corporate hospitality level or just as a, as a spectator. Uh, and you'll get to see really these, these amazing boats and this fantastic event up close and personal. 
Then from there, we'll be in Newport, Rhode Island in June of next year. Uh, same thing again, Newport being the old traditional home of the Cup. And uh, I can tell you, because I was just there last week, those people are extremely jealous that the Cup has moved west and that we're now here. Uh, because I think with what the assets San Francisco has to offer, that it will be pretty difficult for anybody to want to take the Cup anywhere else after we've done the event here. Um, final point, uh, everything is, is available for free on the web. It's all streamed, uh, all of our content, live and on demand. It's all up there for you right now. If you want to take a look at some of the exciting highlights from Plymouth, it'll also uh, give you goosebumps. Um, so uh, please follow us. Please come and join us. And uh, thanks again. And look forward to seeing you uh, in a few months in 2012. Thank you, Tom. What a great story. We love to tell it at the Business Times, and there's a great technology story. There's a great give back to the community story. It's really a wonderful, long legacy it will leave with us. So we wish you well. Uh, now, um, thank you, all of our speakers. Let's have a huge round of applause for all of them. They're so uh, really, really... Forget about what's going on in the stock market. This is just great, great stuff. So thanks to all of you. Thanks for um, allowing us to go a little bit over. I want to thank, again, our sponsors, Shepard Mullen, Victor and Hampton, our title sponsor. I want to thank Hathaway Dinwiddie, who I forgot to say, of course, and all of its legacy projects has the Salesforce.com um, project, so that's a wonderful thing. And uh, Smith Group, thank you to all of our sponsors for making this possible. Thanks to all of you and the great community we have, and we look forward to a bright future. So thanks again to everyone.